The subject concerning patriotism or loving your country is a subject that we need to analyze and evaluate. What does Islam say about loving one's country? How did Hadrat Abdul Fadl al Abbas demonstrate and display that I am a person who loves my country? What is the meaning of this word patriotism? Patriotism means supporting your country in good times or bad times. Wherever you travel around the world, let's say you go to, for example, Iraq or the UK or Canada and you see the flag of Tanzania, you feel a sense of pride, you feel a sense of happiness. Now someone may say, where does Islam say concerning loving your own country? Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He says, Loving your country is part of your faith. Therefore, if you truly want to display your Islamic faith, your Islamic values, then you need to show love towards your nation. Because that is the saying of the Holy Prophet. Of Tanzania. He says, without unity, there is no future for Africa. Therefore, as Tanzanians, we need to be united and show love for our country, regardless of our race background, religion, or culture, or creed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in an interesting verse within the Holy Quran, Surah Rum, chapter 30, verse 22, Allah says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضُ وَاخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتِ لِلْعَالِمِينَ Allah says, I created the heavens and the earth, and different tongues and languages, and different races and colors. Why? Allah here highlights that I have created you all differently. I am different from uncle, for example. I am different from you, right? You may go out, you may see someone from a different religion, a different background, a different race. Allah says, why did I create all this? So that you may recognize one another. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, these truly are signs for knowledgeable men. Inna fi dhalika la ayati lila alimin. Those who are alim, those who are knowledgeable. Therefore, these this diversity that we have is a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Tonight we remember Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. Therefore I expect a little more energy insha'Allah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. On the 15th of August, we celebrated the 75th Independence Day for India. I'll talk about one leader who is known for his humility and humbleness. There's a very interesting story. And for those who would like to take leadership positions in the future, whether it be in a community level or in the political hemisphere, this is a very interesting story. APG Abdul Kalam was the president of India from 2002 to 2007. So once Dr. Kalam attended a function sponsored by Sobhagya Wet Grinders, and on that occasion, he was gifted a grinder as a gift. He was said, did you know you came as a special guest? We'd like to offer you a gift. He said, no, I can't take this, but I need it. He wanted a grinder for his home. So he said, I'll buy it. Now they were uncomfortable to take money from APG Abdul Kalam. But he said, no, I insist. So he wrote a check, 4,850 rupees and gave it to them. Dated August 25, 2014. So this person took it, the honor, but he was a little ashamed to encash the check. You know, when you get a check, you deposit the check and you accept your, you take your money. He was a little shy to accept this money. So what did he do? He said, I'll not cash in the check. Few days later, Abdul Kalam's office calls this office, calls this particular shop. He said, why haven't you encashed your check? I sent you a check. Why didn't you encash it? They said, you know, we don't feel like encashing the check. They said, no, if you don't, we'll return back the grinder. So they took the check, they encashed the check, they deposited the check, received the money. But what did they do before encashing the check? They scanned it and got it photocopied. And they put it as a frame. They framed the check. And they said, look at how honorable our leader is. And this is how honorable we should be as followers of Imam al Hussein, as followers of Al Abbas. And straight away after depositing the check, Imaisha, no, still, Abdul Kalam once again calls them and says, thank you for encashing the check. Thank you for accepting the money. Now someone may say, how is this linked to Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas? Badr Shahin wrote a book titled Al-Abbas. And I urge you all to read this book. There is an entire section within this book titled Al-Abbas, Loyalty to the Nation. 
And then there's another section, loyalty to the homeland. Discussing how Al-Abbas was loyal to his home country. I'll give you an example. One of the Umayyad rulers, one of the Umayyad kings, he said, Iraq is no more than a garden possessed by the Qurayshids. You know what this means? When you own a garden, what do you do? You exploit that garden in order to profit. So these Umayyad rulers would think Iraq is merely a garden. Let us just exploit this garden. Let us make as much we want to make money. So let us exploit Iraq. And this actually led to economic recessions, depressions, downturns. Al Abbas realized that this is not a way to lead. Corruption is never the solution. So Al Abbas stood up. Imam Hussein said, I will never succumb to the demands of Yazid. And Al Abbas said, I also will never succumb to the demand of Yazid. On the night of Ashura, Shimr bin Ziljoshan says, Abbas, you are related to me. Therefore, I offer you security and amnesty. Al Abbas said, I will never forsake my brother. And I will fight against tyranny and injustice. What was Al Abbas displaying? That I will fight for the country. I will fight for my homeland, Iraq. Salam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Please recite one more salawat. Within the last segment of my talk, there's something very interesting. What if someone belongs to another religion? Do I need to respect that person? Very interesting question. Because here we are told that no, you know, only the right religion is Islam. While we recognize that yes, we are proud to be born as Muslims. What about other faiths? I'll start with this example. There was a church constructed in Tanzania, the Mary Immaculate Chamwimo Parish near the State House during the time of Dr. John Magufoli. Within this event, the inaugural event, the inaugural mass, what did President Magufoli do? He began, he embarked on a fundraiser for the construction of a mosque at Chamwimo. He said, let us make, let us gather some funds and I will construct a mosque within a church. Now someone may say, yes, that's Christianity. But Islam isn't like this. No, Islam is like this. In Tanzania, we are honored. We are able to practice our own faith. We are Shias. We are never scared. We are never frightened. In some countries of the world like Afghanistan and Pakistan, people go to the mosque, but they're scared. They know anytime a bomb blast can happen, someone can come with a gun and shoot us. But in Tanzania, Alhamdulillah. I end my talk with this ayat of the Quran, beautiful verse. As Muslims, should we only respect the mosque or should we respect all places of worship? Look at this ayah. Surah 22, Surah Al-Hajj, verses 39 to 40. Allah says, bi annahum gulimu, wa anna Allah ala nasrihim laqadir. Permission has been given to fight. Permission has been given to fight. To whom? To those who have been wronged. Verily, Allah has the power to help them. That means if you are oppressed, then you are allowed to fight. Not the way ISIS and Taliban. They just invade cities and invade countries and take over nations. No, no, no. Allah says if you are oppressed, that's when you fight. Not random picking up a sword and fighting. Then this is interesting. Allah then says, min diarihim bi ghayri haq. Those who are unjustly expelled from their houses, those who are evicted from their homes, they are allowed to fight. Look at this verse. Allah says, if Allah wouldn't have allowed you to defend yourself, then mosques, churches, synagogues where Allah is mentioned would have been destroyed. Allah says, stand up and defend the mosque. No, no, no. Defend the churches as well. No, no, no. Defend the synagogues as well. Why? Because Allah's name is mentioned. Imam Ali once passed by a church. And one sahaba, a little negative minded, he said, there's too much shirk going on. Imam Ali said, no, no, no. Don't focus on the shirk. Think of how much Allah is worshipped in the church. You look at the half, cup, em half empty or you can look at the cup half full. Look at life, look at your country through a positive lens, just like Al Abbas. And not just Muslims, but non Muslims look up to Imam Al Hussein. Allama Zamir Akhtar Naqwi, he writes 
that a man by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte, a French political and military leader, writes a letter to Imam al Hussein and says, You are the one who can't be compared with any creation in the heavens and the earth. Napoleon writes this about Imam al Hussein. Mahatma Gandhi says, If I had an army like 72 soldiers of Hussein, I would have won freedom for India in 24 hours. Why? Who were those 72? I'll give an example of one Sahaba, the Sahaba by the name of Suwaid al khatami There is a correlation between Suwaid and Al Abbas. What is the correlation? Suwaid goes towards the battlefield and he fights a valiant battle, but he becomes unconscious. So they think he is dead. A few hours later, these people kill Aba Abdullah and they start chanting, Hussein is dead, Hussein has been killed. Straight away Suwaid hears that my master has been killed. He regains consciousness. He has a knife with him. He says, I will fight and I will fight and I will fight. He fights with his knife. He fights valiantly, but then he's martyred. Who martyrs him? A man by the name of Zaid ibn Ruqad. Zaid ibn Ruqad fights him and he kills him. Do you know what else Zaid ibn Ruqad did? Abdullah ibn Muslim ibn Aqil, a young man, he fights. He is in the battlefield and he hits him. He hits him with an arrow. He hits Abdullah ibn Muslim with an arrow on his forehead. Abdullah attempts to remove the arrow from his forehead, but then he takes another arrow and shoots it on his chest. Abdullah ibn Muslim falls from his horse and passes away. What else did Zayd ibn Ruqad do? While Abbas is heading towards the tents after collecting the water from the river Euphrates, Zayd ibn Ruqad, he goes and amputates the right arm of Al-Abbas. Al-Abbas says, if you cut my right arm, it doesn't matter, I will still defend my brother Hussein. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Rahimallah man kara al-fatiha.